In November of 2012, Weldon Bradshaw was waiting for a new liver. His doctors had told him that he had less than a week to live, and that had been six days ago. Weldon had been healthy all his life. He was a runner. He was a cross-country coach at the collegiate school. And even in 2009, when he was first diagnosed with liver disease, symptoms at that point were fairly minimal. But by the summer of 2012, he'd taken a real turn for the worse. And in November, he was lying in his VCU hospital bed with his cell phone on his chest. And in his own words, it wasn't so much the 11th hour as it was 11.55 and the clock was ticking. Well, Weldon got his call. He got his new liver and has plans today to dance at his granddaughter's wedding. Zena Coles could be identified by the backpack she carried with her everywhere she went. She carried the backpack because inside it was a device called the Freedom Driver. And what the Freedom Driver does is power the artificial heart that was keeping Zena alive. Zena and her husband had four children, and we were hoping to have them at our uh, Tree of Life ceremony at UNOS at around Christmas time, but she was too sick to leave the hospital. By February, she was still in the hospital, still quite sick, but sure that by Valentine's Day, she'd have the heart that she was waiting for. On February the 23rd, Zena died before her match was found. How many of you have that heart on your driver's license or have signed up to be an organ donor? That's terrific. Thank you very much. You could save as many as seven lives by doing that. But have you given any thought to how the recipients of your organs might be found? As of today, there are 121,910 Americans waiting on the organ transplant wait list. If this is a typical year, about 28,000 of them will find transplants. Some of the ones who are waiting and don't get their call this year will be able to keep waiting and hope for a call in the future. Some of them won't be able to wait. So 79 times a day, somewhere in the United States, an organ is donated and a decision has to be made, one with life and death consequences. So how do you make such an impossible decision? Let's imagine that we're writing the waiting list rules from scratch. We can start by ruling out any organ that won't match the recipient, any organ that medically would, might be rejected by their body. So no A-type blood donors into B-type recipients, no Bs into As, no As, Bs, or ABs into Os. But that's just the first layer. We ask transplant centers about 130 different antigens that could provoke an immune response in their patient that would endanger their transplant. So we'll rule out the folks for whom that organ might not work. But that still leaves many people, in the case of kidneys, thousands of candidates for whom each organ might work. And we're going to need to put them in some kind of order. So let's start with the easy way. Let's put them in order according to when they registered on the waiting list. We all know how to stand in line, right? What could be any fairer than that? We'll give the next organ to the candidate who's been waiting the longest. It's easy to measure. It's easy to understand and the system can treat everyone in exactly the same way. So now let's look at the list that we've put together. Say today, candidate one on the list has that lucky body chemistry that says almost any organ might work in his body. While candidate two on the list, she wasn't as lucky. She's got more of the potential immune responses. She's much harder to match. Finding that special organ for her is like finding a needle in a haystack. Now, we've screened for this organ, that's why they're both on this list, and we know that it will work in either one of them. If we don't get an organ to candidate number one, he'll probably be able to find an organ tomorrow because he's easy to match. If we don't get an organ to candidate number two, who's much harder to match, it could be months, it could be years before we find another one that fits the unique body chemistry that she has. Now, that's a relatively minor adjustment. So we can make that tweak for those really hard to match candidates and still basically be working from a line, still basically have a, a first in, first out system, one that we all understand. So let's put another wrinkle on it. Another organ is offered for donation and another decision has to be made and this time, candidate one again is at the top of our list because we're using waiting time. Candidate two this time though is much, much sicker. If candidate one doesn't get an organ today, chances are he'll be here tomorrow for the next offer. Candidate two might not be. And surely that's an adjustment that we can make too. 
In fact, even candidate one could probably decide himself to step aside and say, here, you have this one in a situation like that. So we move candidate two to the top because she's sicker and leave candidate one behind her until we look through the rest of the list and we realize that there are not one sick candidate but dozens and dozens of desperately ill candidates, many of whom might not make it until the next offer. So are we going to ask candidate one to stand aside for all of them? Now we could do that and we wouldn't have to leave them behind because eventually candidate one will become one of them. They too will be so sick that the day will come when they need a transplant today, right now, and they can get to the top of the line that way. So now we have a completely different system. We started by saying that waiting in line was the right way. The system treats everyone the same. Now we're talking about a medical urgency-based system, a sick is first system where everyone has at least an equal chance at getting that transplant before it's too late. But here comes another candidate and she's got another question. She's clearly progressing towards end-stage organ failure. But she's relatively healthy today. The candidate in front of her is sicker than she is. There's no question. In fact, he's so sick that even if he gets the transplant, he might not survive the year. If we could get a transplant to the healthier candidate before disease weakens her body, she might live a decade. Would it be wasting an organ which there are not enough of, to give that organ to the sicker candidate? So we have a third option. We've talked about an option based on waiting time where the system treats everyone the same, even if it allows them to all have different outcomes. We've talked about an option based on sickest first that says everyone should have a chance, even if we don't get the best use of the organs. And now we're talking about a very different principle, which is whether we should try to maximize the benefit of a very scarce resource. And that's the hardest one of all because to pursue that third option, you'd have to be willing to turn some very sick people away. Now, even if you think you've figured out how best to do this for one organ, you look at the others and you realize that the balance will be different for them all. For kidney rules, for which there is an effective mechanical substitute, dialysis, we can lean more towards a waiting time system. For livers, for which there is no plan B, we lean more towards a medical urgency plan. Lungs are generally based on medical urgency, but lungs have that benefit piece that acknowledges that there is a point at which it's futile to transplant. Pancreas, heart, intestines, they all have their own set of rules and they all reach that balance in their own way. And there are hundreds of other questions to answer. Should prisoners be allowed to donate and receive organs? Is it ever appropriate for a child to be a living donor? Should we pay donors or their families? Would that create more donations or fewer? Should we treat citizens and non-citizens on the waiting list the same? In July of this year, a new federal regulation will give us oversight over hand and face transplants for the first time. And that's causing us to take a look at how those might be similar to other organs and how they might be different. For example, we've never allowed a transplant recipient to demand an organ from a donor of a particular race or gender. But does that still make sense if we're talking about hands? Now, we can debate these questions endlessly and we can have a lot of fun doing it, but to do our job, we have to actually have an answer. And we're very conscious that we work in an, in an environment that is completely dependent on goodwill. So it's important not only that we get the answer right, but that we get the answer right in a way that maintains the public confidence in the system and allows people to continue to be comfortable making the decision to be organ donors. So we work very hard to make sure that our decisions are transparent, consistent, and timely. Our policymaking process is transparent throughout. Any one of you right now can go online and look up all the organ allocation rules on our website. 
our committees who make recommendations and our board of directors that approves new policies are democratically elected. Any proposal that a committee makes to change the allocation rules has to go out for public comment and has to include both the values and the data that support their recommendation. Not only our researchers, but researchers outside of our organization are allowed to look at our database to consider that data to question our decisions and to make suggestions of their own. Now, consistency in organ allocation relies in large part on the use of the computer. While our committees will wrestle with big questions, when it's time to allocate each specific organ, no human could make those kind of decisions. The emotional push and pull of saying yes and no to individual identified candidates would make it impossible to treat everyone the same. But once the computer starts to run, it doesn't know whether you're rich, it doesn't know whether you're famous, it doesn't even know whether you're nice. The computer takes this most personal gift of all and it allocates it in a completely impersonal way. The computer also helps us make sure that our decisions are timely. If every time an organ was offered for donation for transplant, we had to rehash all the issues that go into an allocation decision, real people would die while we talked. While no system will ever be perfect, and we continue to try to make the system better and better as we go, when an organ becomes available, the people on the waiting list need the best decision that is possible right now. That's why, just a few blocks away, right here in downtown Richmond, Virginia, there are biostatisticians at computers poring over data from thousands of past transplants. There are policy writers working with committees of medical experts, breaking down the kinds of questions that we've been talking about here. There are IT teams reprogramming the allocation computers to get the most current data and the most up-to-date policy rules into the system. And right in the middle of all of that is the organ center. The organ center is the air traffic control system for the National Transplant Network, and it's right here. Those folks are on, working the phones and working the computers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to help the transplant professionals in the field and their patients. Because 79 times a day, an organ is offered for transplantation, and someone is going to have to make an impossible decision. Thank you.